19 Nocturne Boulevard. Nocturne Boulevard? Not far. When you hit Howard, hang a right. Howard meets Philip at a weird kind of angle. Then you cross James and Paul. You can't miss Nocturne. It's just past the automatic. 19 Nocturne Boulevard. Your address for suspenseful stories of the speculative, strange, and supernatural. Tonight's episode is The Facts Concerning and is the fourth Lovecraft 5 episode. Yes, this is 19 Nocturne Boulevard. Won't you step inside? Did you have any trouble finding it? What do you mean, what kind of a place is it? Why, it's a private dining room at a well-known New England university. Can't you tell? So nice to have you all here. The weather has been so mild, I feared it would destroy any atmosphere I might have expected for my story. And the orchestra would be in rehearsal. At least it's rather somber. A clear day can mean a darker night. True. Depending on the phase of the moon. Yes, well, the dinner was... mm, passable. Oh, faint praise indeed, coming from our resident starving writer. Do you know I believe the college's food plan is quite brilliant? (laughs) Brilliant. Uh, Are they strapped for economy? You see, the food is precisely enough to sustain life, but without anything so extravagant as taste, which might take one's mind off one's studies. I found it perfectly adequate. But very little in this world will take your mind off your science, Herbert. How about having the studies take our mind off the food, then? We came for a story. And I perceive a box on the table behind you which does not match the decor or the amount of dust in this room. (laughs) You artists notice everything, though your comment on dust surprises me after seeing your house. It does things for me. Inspiration. At least this place, while old, is well maintained. Well, not so old as all that. The dining hall wing wasn't built until 1804, very recent comparatively. But my story. I warn you, I have a little idea as to presentation. After that night at your place, Richard, I wanted something unique. Don't expect anything like that from me. Don't worry. We don't. I have this rather long history to my tale, you see. And I know I tend to wax a bit pedantic, so I thought I would help to set certain facts in the mind by beginning with a bit of a game. Oh, I'm game. Is it questions again? No. I have a small description written for each of the major players in the history of the story and thought I might give one to each of you. Well, each of us, for I include myself, to portray. It would help keep them all straight. Is it necessary to keep them all straight? I think it will help make the history flow. It's a technique of acting out history used to great advantage by Mrs. Schartz uh, Metacum, a fellow teacher here. Amateur dramatics? Oh, you needn't do more than read from the card. I don't expect strutting about and soliloquizing. It sounds amusing. Ooh, I'm in. You may be in for more than you expected, old pal. Good then. Let's see. Herbert here, then Charles, Edward, and Richard. The cards have only the basics on each of the fellows. They're generations of a single family, you see. And the backside is a nameplate to aid in recalling who is who. Charming. You're staring. Am I supposed to begin? I could go first. Oh, oh no. L- let me. No, no. I will begin the tale, and then we'll go around the table. You'll be the second, though, Herbert. At least it'll be over with early. That must mean I in the climax of the tale. Oh, you got nothing on me. Just wait. <clears throat> we begin with Sir Wade Jarman. I was one of the earliest explorers of the Congo region and had written erudite of its tribes, animals, and supposed antiquities. Are we supposed to be British? You haven't really given us any background. Oh, yes. The Jarman family was part of a well-respected house in England, though it has um, died out. So these are not only Brits, but long-dead Brits. Are we doing Shakespeare? We didn't worry about accents. I should say not. I don't want to lose my place or I might have to start again. 
Indeed, my innovative conjectures on a prehistoric white Congolese civilization were the basis for my book Observation on the Several Parts of Africa, published in 1765. I, fearless adventurer that I once had been, was then placed in madhouse. That sounds a bit promising. Madness is quite fascinating. I have a strong hope that there will be details to the story to intrigue you, Herbert. Have you ever looked into the study of ethnology? Hmm. Should I read now? History first. Quick, Bracy. Well, this family, the Germans, are not German, but British. The history of the family is quite interesting, but it ended recently with the death of the final generation, a son, just one, who、uh, set himself on fire when he discovered something about his heritage. He set himself on fire? Now I'm interested. You've got our attention. It's not some simple defect like a hair lip, a club foot. Much more than that. Let's begin again. I am Suwei Jerman, famous explorer of the Congo region. I wrote a book and went mad. Now me next, I suppose. This one is Sir Wade's son, Philip. Philip was a highly peculiar person. His appearance and conduct were, in many particulars, so coarse that he was universally shunned. Though he did not inherit his father's madness. He was densely stupid, <laughs> and given to periods of uncontrollable violence. Is this supposed to be funny? Funny? Did you give me this one on purpose? Well, yes, but only because it was the shortest. I felt you'd have less interest in the dramatic bore and getting it over with. Hmm. Is that the sum of your wisdom, great Sir Philip? No. There's more. I forgot to mention. It's just the first part. Now we'll come back to you. So Herbert is violent and stupid. What are you, Charles? I am Robert, Sir Robert German, son of Philip and the daughter of his gamekeeper. They'll let anyone in, won't they? Oh, I am tall and fairly handsome, with a sort of weird Eastern grace, a scholar and investigator. I studied scientifically the vast collection of relics which my mad grandfather brought from Africa. You should have given me the scientist. At least I would know where I stand. Robert is an ethnologist and explorer, not a hard scientist. Even so, my turn. I am Sir Alfred German, son of Neville.、Uh, wait, are we missing someone? No, Neville is the son of Robert. You're Robert's grandson. Where's Neville then? He's.、Uh... We didn't have enough people. I felt we could skip over Neville. I'll fill in his details should they become necessary. All right. Don't worry. You're like Alfred. He ran away with the circus. What? You're joking, right? No, no. He actually, literally, ran away with the circus. We'll come back to that. So, I am Sir Arthur German, son of Alfred, the circus performer and a music hall singer. <laughs> and they blink at who Americans decide to marry. Arthur is a poet and a dreamer. Oh, Warren, you had too much fun choosing who was to play what, didn't you? The poetic delicacy of Arthur German was the more remarkable because of his uncouth personal appearance, his expression, his facial angle, and the length of his arms gave a thrill of repulsion to those who met him for the first time. Sounds a bit like Abraham Lincoln. You know it does. How odd. So now we know who we are. What's next? We go back to the beginning, and that's me, Sir Wade. Oh, first there has been mention of the physical oddities that crept into the family line. I should state that before Sir Wade's time, portraits showed that the family was very typical of English nobility: chinless and pasty. Now, now, every Brit I've ever met has been perfectly nice. You have to remember, Sir Wade's era was the mid-eighteenth century. And there's no record of any physical issues or madness before this time, or at least not out of the ordinary for the time and place. And state of medicine. True. So Wade made several trips to Africa, returning from one of those trips with a reclusive bride and a newborn son. And that's Herbert. Philip. This bride was notable, for no one ever saw her, or at least not much of her. She was supposed to have been the daughter of a Portuguese trader who despised English ways and wouldn't have any English servants. Wade humored her and put her up in a wing of her own at the estate, where no one saw her or the child but Wade himself. A woman who doesn't want to go out and gossip or shop. 
quite a mythological figure. His wife had accompanied him back from the second and longest of his trips and left again with him on the third and final, never to return. But Wade returned. He hasn't yet gone mad. We're all waiting for that. The only thing ever said about the wife, even her name is left unrecorded, was that she had a violent disposition. While they made the journey back to Africa, Wade would permit no one to care for his young son save a loathsome native woman from Guinea. This family sure knows how to pick their women, don't they? <laughs> I notice you don't give names for any of them. Funny how wives tend to be forgotten in these epic histories. There's one among them, Arthur's mother herself, who was actually quite a fascinating character, and I might look further into her antecedents, but for the most part, the family made some odd choices indeed. So far, I get the feeling that this is leading to a disquisition of eugenics rather than on ethnology. In other words, take a so-called noble house and marry in generation after generation, people of dubious merits, and see how the line flows. Well, that's part of it. I'm rather surprised. It is fascinating. I've heard of similar experiments with rats. Much easier to observe since their generations are months rather than decades apart. And of course, the difficulties of convincing a human family to participate. Well, I'm just pleased you're so enthusiastic. Go ahead and read the second card then. Right. As Philip grew out of infancy, his father started to avoid him, muttering wild stories about his encounters in Africa, but never making anything clear. Philip grew up small but powerful, with incredible agility. He married, but before his son was born, he joined the Navy as a common sailor. He made his way onto a merchantman in the African trade, and gained a reputation for feats of strength and climbing. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not going to just turn into a big argument against intermarrying with native tribes people, is it? Was Wade's wife a Zulu or something? Oh, no. I would say that was surprisingly far from the point of the history, though you might well suspect it since so much of the story centers around Africa. But no, none of the individuals involved are Africans, tribal or otherwise. Oh, no. Interesting. I had a little idea about that myself. Put it aside, and let's finish with Philip. Ah, one last note. Philip disappeared one night as the ship. What ship? Ah, the merchantman. As the ship lay off the Congo coast. Oh, maybe he went looking for his mother. You said she went back to the Congo and never returned, right? And Philip was never heard from again? More or less. Oh? Rumors. We'll be there later. Me, then? Another short interlude. Some details about Sir Wade's madness. He spent a great deal of time in the local pub. While avoiding his son? Actually, yes, but he had a tendency to rave while in his cups. Doesn't everyone? And it was this rather <clears throat> random talk that chiefly led his friends to deem him mad. He would often speak of wild sights and scenes under a Congo moon, of the gigantic walls and pillars of a forgotten city, crumbling and vine-grown and damp, silent stone steps leading interminably down into the darkness of abysmal treasure vaults and inconceivable catacombs. Oh, yes, I can see it. I never really considered the artistic possibilities of Africa. Hmm. It was particularly unwise of him to rave of the strange creatures that populated such a city, for he boasted of what he saw in the jungle and of how he dwelt among terrible ruins and the creatures that inhabited them. Little wonder he was locked away. Well, the wonder lay in that he showed no particular regret when being shut up. In fact, he seemed to find the confinement comforting, as if something were being locked out rather than he being locked in. Hmm... I must make a note. Feel free. It's my turn to reveal the next bit. Oh, I should add that Robert broke the cycle and married a perfectly acceptable woman, a daughter of the seventh Viscuit Brightholm. Rather than following the um, family tendency to pick entertainers and other uh, women at random. Did it help the line at all? Actually, no. Of the three children they had, two were never seen. They were kept locked away, presumably due to some hereditary defect. Interesting. May I? Oh, yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Now, Philip is tall and handsome. No, I'm Philip. You're my son, Robert. Uh, of course. Uh, Robert was quite the scholar. He scientifically studied, as best as possible in 1815, the vast collection of relics which his mad grandfather, that's you, Warren, brought from Africa. It's really quite a pity the way early explorers looted everything in sight. 
All those things are of great historical value and should be in the hands of researchers, not adorning trophy rooms. I read in the paper recently about someone selling a mummy at one of the big auction houses. Maybe the college should buy it. Most of the items that have spent time in personal collections are worthless anyway, in any scientific sense. Without any provenance, there's no way to tell the real from the fake. Precisely. Can Robert get a word in edgewise? So sorry. Go on. <clears throat> Robert spent a great deal of time on his own expeditions into the interior of Africa. In 1849, his second son, Neville... The non-deformed one? Non-deformed, but invisible. <laughs> Maybe we should pull him up a chair. Neville, a singularly repellent person, ran away with a vulgar dancer. Another one? But was pardoned upon his return in the following year. He came back a widower with an infant son... Alfred. Ta-da! Who was one day to be the father of Arthur German. And I'm the one who set himself on fire? But we're not there yet. But before we move on to Alfred, there's another tragic instance to recount. Robert became a bit unhinged himself. Do I have a card for that? No, really, I was just going to... Get on with it. An elderly man, Robert had spent years collecting the legends of the Unga tribe, native to the area of the expeditions taken by both Robert and his mad grandfather. He expressed a desire to validate his grandfather's claims of a strange lost city, particularly one populated by the sort of creatures Wade used to rave about. Do you have any solid information about these creatures you keep hinting about? Not much, but accounts say Sir Wade made wild claims about the white tribe that had once lived in a stone city deep in the interior. Although it wasn't apparently recent, others said that he claimed that while people built the city, it had been overrun with apes but apes who were able to mix with the humans. Mix? Are you talking about getting together for tea? Or interbreeding? I mean, it was... Uh, no details. Uh, that was someone's vague recollection in a journal, so it's anyone's best guess what Sir Wade actually said. Hmm. Despite the persuasive nature of the evolutionary theory, there is no evidence that any strain of apes is close enough to humans to crossbreed. Crossbreeds aren't impossible. Not with humans, of course, but there's always mules. I always pity the donkey. <clears throat> it, it's sort of like the ooh bird. <clears throat> right. So, through correspondence, Wade reached a fellow explorer, Samuel Seaton, who eventually made his way back to England, brought some interesting tales with him. How interesting? No one knows. No one? Yes, we can only conjecture from the effect it had on Sir Robert. Which was? He went upstairs and killed all three of his children. Neville and the two no one ever saw, before making every feasible attempt to kill himself. Holy cow! I thought you were one of the saner ones, Charles. Should I be killing someone now? <laughs> every feasible attempt? He failed to end his own life and was locked away, dying two years later. What did the Seton fellow say about it all? Oh, nothing. He was already dead. Robert strangled him first. The only survivor was young Alfred. It appeared that Neville, for all his, uh... Absentness? Uh, basically... For all he lacked, he died in defense of his son, and Alfred inherited the title title before he could even walk. And he still ran away with a circus. Nothing survived of the information Seton brought? A pieces of correspondence survived, mostly notes of tales from the Unga tribe, who believed in a gray city populated by white apes and ruled by a white god. Oh, uh, my turn, right? Almost. Oh. I didn't think this would catch your fancy so well. It's quite an amusing idea, Warren. Rather surprised, really. Uh, thank you. Oh. Bray, continue. Let's just move on to Edward, uh, Alfred. <clears throat> Sir Alfred German was a baronet before his fourth birthday, but his tastes never matched his title. At 20, he had joined a band of music hall performers, and at 36, had deserted his wife and child to travel with an itinerant American circus. Quite apart from their tendency to marry beneath them, the men themselves tend to abscond, which doesn't speak much for nobility. An argument could be made that they're tainted from past generations. Or that rich men are just predisposed to be bastards, in the personality sense. <clears throat> Alfred's end was very revolting. Among the animals in the exhibition with which he traveled was a huge bull gorilla of lighter color than the average. You mentioned something about white apes, didn't you? Oh no, it was a supposed white race in the interior. Hmm. And the apes took over their city. Hmm. The beast was very popular among the performers. Alfred German was fascinated with this gorilla, and on many occasions the two would eye each other for long periods through the intervening bars. Sounds like he was a bit of a 
Oh. A what? A bit of an anthropologist himself. Alfred obtained permission to train the animal. Astonishing audiences and fellow performers alike with a success. One morning, as the gorilla and Alfred were rehearsing an exceedingly clever boxing match, the beast hit him too hard. I thought it was kangaroos who are notable for boxing. Or orangutans. Recall that odd story from our friend Auguste. I guess gorillas can box if they want to. What's next? A female president? Of what followed, members of the greatest show on earth do not like to speak. Oh, he was with Bonham. <laughs> Funny. You never think of these tales happening in places you might actually have been. P.T. Barnum could hardly be called a place. You know what I mean. I know you keep interrupting me. They did not expect to hear Sir Alfred German emit a shrill, inhuman scream, or see him seize the gorilla with both hands, dash it to the floor of the cage, and bite fiendishly at its hairy throat. The gorilla retaliated, and before anything could be done, the body, which had belonged to the baronet, was past recognition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. As one born every minute. One what? Idiot who wants to box a wild animal, I suppose. Well, Richard, I suppose you will be ending this little tale. Am I? Oh, just a moment. Right. A few notes first. I thought you might enjoy that bit. Cheers. I can't find my notes right now, but if you'd like to go on, Richard, I'll interject as things come up. Certainly. Arthur German was the son of Sir Alfred German and a music hall singer of unknown origin. If I may interject. That was sure. Go ahead. This woman, whose name was never recorded, but I don't doubt I could find it if need be since she only died in 1911, I believe was the one I mentioned earlier as being quite an interesting character. Not the titled lady? No, she appears to have been very, uh, stolid. Arthur's mother, however, was determined. When Alfred left them, or possibly after his horrid death, she apparently marched right into German house, infant son on her hip. Not even a perambulator to her name. Makes for a prettier and more destitute picture. Babe in arms, anyway, and took over. She apparently stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with any and all opposition on behalf of her son. People will do most anything for money. That's the rub. There was almost no money left, per se. There was the title and some land, and German House and not much else. And yet she claimed it on behalf of her son, and apparently did a reasonably good job of running the estate during his childhood, got at least enough money out of it to send Arthur to decent schools, and see to it he had some idea of family and history. Brave woman. Very well. So my mother had redeeming qualities above and beyond her social status. May I go on? I have a bit more. Arthur German was not like any other German before him, for he was a poet and a dreamer. Ta-da! As an artist, I can sympathize, anyway. A locals attributed his sensitivity to the Latin blood of his Portuguese great-great-great, uh, great... Let's see, I'm great. Uh, Charles is great-great. Don't forget Invisible Neville. You know who I mean, anyway. Uh, besides, most people just chalked it up to his music hall mother, who, of course, was never accepted by the gentry. Oh, no, of course not. How horrible. While his nature was poetic, his appearance was just the opposite. Most of the Germans had possessed a subtly odd and repellent cast, but Arthur's case was very striking. Ape-like? Uh, uh, possibly, I suppose. <laughs> I, Arthur German, being of sound mind and ugly body, <laughs> took the highest honors at Oxford and seemed likely to redeem the intellectual fame of the family. Oxford? Kudos to your mother, indeed. I'll tell her when I see her. Arthur planned to continue the work of his forefathers in African ethnology and antiquities, utilizing the truly wonderful, though strange, collection of Sir Wade. Which, though valueless in many ways, having been tossed about by a collector, would still be fascinating to see. I dare say. Who knows what he may have found in the prehistoric civilization in which the mad explorer had so implicitly believed? Arthur explored tale after tale about the silent jungle city and the nameless, unsuspected race of jungle hybrids mentioned in Ward's journal. Wait. Right person, wrong name. Sounds like a clear case of morbid fascination, though, for he sought out more information after his mother's death in 1911 and even made an expedition himself as soon as he could liquidate some assets to fund it. That's not precisely what's on the card. I'm embellishing. 
arranging with the Belgian authorities for a party of guides, he spent a year in the Anga and Khan country. Among the Kaliris was an aged chief called Moanu, who possessed not only a highly retentive memory, but a singular degree of interest in old legends. Moanu even added his own account of the Stone City and the White Apes. Many long years it has been since things walked in the city of Grey Stones, and many years more and more since man ever trod the paths within. He told of the Nubuangu tribe, which had annihilated the beings within the city and destroyed many of the structures. Every ape lay dying. Every ape lay dead. The chief of the Nabangas, him they called Iron Foot, trod on the bodies of the enemy, for they were no more than dirt to him. And lo, in their wicked shrine, in the center of the ruined city, lay the prize Iron Foot had come to possess. What they came for was apparently a mummy. It was called among the various local tribes the White Goddess, and was supposed to be the remains of one of the ape things queens preserved and revered for just over a century. The White Goddess was a queen in her own right, when she lived like mortals live, down among the hairy folk, but came a god from a distant land far to the west. He wore the sun for a crown and strode the land on giant feet. Apparently, this strange new god married the princess, later known as the White Goddess, and they ruled the ape city together. This is starting to sound a bit like a Burroughs fancy, though I don't think Tars never stooped to wooing apes. I always say live and let live, but that's a bit outside even my tolerance. That is, assuming the strange god was a human, and in fact was... I'm sorry, are we assuming? We'll assume in a moment. Moanu had an interesting little end to his tale. When the princess bore the god a son, they returned to the homeland of the god. It was many, many moons before the god and princess returned, for the princess was lonely in the distant world and wished for the company of her own people. They ruled but a short time before the princess left her mortal life and rose to the top of the great world tree. She died? I hope so. You you see... uh... The god... Stricken with grief at her passing and loath to lose her, mummified the body so he would always know she remained in the city, awaiting his return. Ugh, romantic. I... I... I'm, I'm at a loss for words. Impressive. Hmm. Though the god never returned to claim his princess, the white goddess, as it was now called, became a symbol of supremacy to all the neighboring tribes, which is why the Nabwangu felt the need to capture it. They should have stuck with a flag. Many moons later yet, the child of the princess and the god, grown to impressive manhood, found his way to the city to claim his rightful place. Really? And what happened to him? Sadly, Moano didn't know. Whatever the truth behind any of the legends, they make for picturesque storytelling. Herbert, you've been awfully quiet. I'm interested. We still haven't made the leap from unlikely legends to Richard going up in flames. Pray continue, Warren. In early 1912, Arthur found the fabled lost city, or what was left of it. It was apparently rather smaller than he had expected. Unfortunately, the modest size of the expedition prevented operations toward clearing the one visible passageway that seemed to lead down to the system of vaults which Sir Wayne had mentioned. You never mentioned underground vaults before. Oh, yes, he did. It's really just mentioned in passing. And it was blocked up. They spoke with as many natives and chiefs as they could, but found no further information on the White Goddess, except that the Nabongo had it. Oh, probably performed unspeakable rites and rituals beneath the glassy eyes of the once-living thing. Very likely. Finally, Arthur was introduced to a Monsieur Verheren, Belgian agent at a trading post. Is the Congo still under Belgian control? If it isn't, the change must have been rather recent. Verheren claimed he could not only locate but obtain the stuffed goddess. It is true. These once mighty Mbangus are now the submissive servants of King Albert's government. Ignorant savages. Some beads and trinkets, perhaps some rum, and I could get them to part with their own mothers. Chairman sailed for England, therefore, with the exultant probability that he would, within a few months, receive a priceless ethnological relic and confirm the wildest of his great-great-grandfather's stories. Wildest? Perhaps not. Frankly, I wouldn't want to see proof of some of the implications. The miscegenation? 
That's actually what I'm finding the most fascinating to consider. Mr. Jehuzit? Finish first. Once you let Herbert start, there's no telling where it might end. Arthur German waited. Meanwhile, he studied the papers and reports of his great, uh, uh, Sir Wade. He found it interesting that while there was much whispering about the mysterious and secluded wife, no tangible relic of her remained. What, you, you expect someone stuffed her too? Ahem, <clears throat> I think he means a portrait. Or a lock of hair. Or even a journal of her own. And there was nothing. Chairman put it down to Wade's insanity, figuring that she might have angered him by contradicting some of his wild Africa tales, particularly since she had also spent time on the Dark Continent. Or perhaps they just had an efficient maid or two in the intervening century. <clears throat> in June of 1913, a letter had arrived from Monsieur Verheren, saying that he had found the stuffed goddess. He averred it was a most extraordinary object, quite beyond the power of a layman to classify whether it was human or simian, only a scientist could determine. Unless, like such artifacts from Barnum and his brethren the world over, it was made piecemeal. Stitched out of whole cloth? More like a crazy quilt. And of course, time and the Congo climate are not kind to mummies. I shudder to think of the depredations of insects and mildew. And apparently this one was not preserved by a craftsman of any sort of skill. And yet, it was still intact in the hole, and recognizable, so they couldn't fault him over much. Uh, mummies are primarily preserved through drying. How could anyone ever undertake that in a damp and steamy jungle? Almost done now. Where was I? Oh, yes. Around the creature's neck was a golden chain bearing an empty locket, on which there were immoral designs, no doubt some hapless traveler's keepsake, taken by the Nabangus and hung upon the goddess as a charm. No doubt. Utter coincidence. In commenting on the mummy's appearance, the Belgian expressed a humorous wonder just how it would strike his correspondent. Me, in case anyone has forgotten during the intermission. But these hints really didn't give much to go on. The boxed object was delivered to German on the afternoon of August 3rd, 1913, and was conveyed immediately to the large chamber which housed the collection of African specimens. The final card now? He got an extra card. Richard has the artistic temperament. Just one more moment. What ensued can best be gathered from the tales of the servants and from things later examined. Aged Soames, the family butler, tells the most ample and coherent tale. Sure, and the master sent all of us away, wanting to be alone with his new treasure. This was not unusual, and none thought twice on it. We heard the sound of hammer and chisel when he opened the box almost right away. That excited he was to clap eyes on it. Shortly, there came a terrible scream. Ah! Ah, that was part of the... Artistic license. It comes with artistic temperament. Ready now? Warn me next time. Immediately after, German emerged from the room, rushing frantically about as if pursued, and finally disappearing down the stairs to the cellar. The servants were utterly dumbfounded and watched at the head of the stairs, but a smell of oil was all that came up from the regions below. After dark, a rattling was heard at the door leading from the cellar into the courtyard, and a stable boy saw Arthur German glistening from head to foot with oil steal furtively out and vanish on the black moor surrounding the house. Then, in an exaltation of supreme horror, a spark appeared on the moor, a flame arose, and a pillar of human fire reached to the heavens. The house of German no longer existed. Did he at least leave a note? No, but the fragments that add up to the horror he discovered were clearly found and assembled afterward, principally the thing in the box. His ancestress. Don't jump ahead. <laughs> Funny. The stuffed goddess was a nauseous sight, withered and eaten away, but it was clearly a mummified white ape of some unknown species, less hairy than any recorded variety and infinitely nearer mankind quite shockingly so. Was it supposed to be a secret? You're serious? Warren. <sighs> yes. <laughs> the arms of the golden locket about the creature's neck with the German arms and the resemblance between the shriveled face to none other than the sensitive Arthur German applied with vivid, ghastly, and unnatural horror. I thought Warren made it eminently clear. 
This should lead to an interesting field of study. Do you think the white apes she belonged to might still exist in the Congo? No, uh, they were wiped out by the Nabumbums. Is the mummy at least intact? Oh no. Members of the Royal Anthropological Institute burned the thing and threw the locket into a well. They did what? And they call themselves scientists? Ah, uh, thus endeth the lesson. Now that you know how to find us, don't be a stranger. We have five of them right over there. Tonight's episode, The Facts Concerning, was written by Julie Hoverson, heavily inspired and based on the story The Facts Concerning the Late Arthur German and His Family by H.P. Lovecraft. In tonight's episode, Warren was Glenn Hallstrom. Charles was Michael Coleman of Tales of the Extraordinary. Richard was Philemon Vanderbeck. Edward was Brian Hendrickson, and Herbert was Carl Kulbich. Moanu, the tribal chief, was Danner Hoverson. Monsieur Verheren was Domian de Groot of the Witch Hunter Chronicles. And the butler Solmes was Ayub Cote. Music for this episode was by the Skidmore College Orchestra performing works of Edvard Grieg and Camille Saint-Saëns, as found on the Muse Open website at www.musopen.com. Cover art for this episode was by Brett Coolstock. Sound and mastering was done by Julie Hoverson. Sound effects were found on soundsnap.com, onesoundfx.com, and sonomic.com. The opening theme was by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. The opening credits featured Cole Hornaday, Renaud LaBeouf, and Julie Hoverson. All persons, places, and events in this story were fictitious or used in a fictitious manner and are not meant to reflect any persons, places, or things, living, dead, or undead. Questions? Comments? We would love to hear from you. Contact us at 19nocturne at live.com, that's 19nocturne, or check out our website at www.19nocturneboulevard.com. This presentation is copyright 2011 to Julie Hoverson and Reality Productions, and is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial license. Spread the show around, but don't try to make money off it. Stoop, stoop the stooping apes. <laughs> he stooped the stooping ape. <laughs> Impressive manhood. <laughs> he was swinging low, man. <laughs> <laughs> Among the Calaris. Calaris? Do we even know how to pronounce that? I'm sure Richard would pronounce it. He's reading it off a Okay. <laughs> Dear God, we're going to get letters. Okay. I think they're all imaginary. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> hey, there's a gorilla driving that bus. What's going on? You How How do you want You want this as a gorilla scream? <laughs> That's right. Oh, I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. Here they are all sitting in my shorts. Sir Alfred German was a baronet before his first... First... <clears throat> <gasps> Ah. I was going to say, it's like women bashing here. A little misogynistic uh, little meeting here of the... Of the... Of the... Was it... What do we call them? Uh, chauvinist pigs? <laughs> Misogynist is what he is. 